yeah, he's convinced that you will like it one day. Now you're thinking of going to counseling. Like, it oh, yeah. does feel like he is pressuring you. And also earlier on, I mean, she's like, I accepted it and welcomed it. But then you're like, actually, I, I hate it. Hello and welcome to the Pillow Talks podcast. We're your hosts, Vanessa and Xander Marin. I'm a sex therapist with over 20 years of experience. And I'm just a regular dude. We share the ups and downs in our relationship while giving you step-by-step techniques for improving yours. Make sure you subscribe for your weekly double date full of totally doable sex tips, practical relationship advice, hilarious and honest stories of what really goes on behind closed bedroom doors, and so much more. It's the sex education you wish you'd had. Babe, I am so excited about today's episode. I am too. I couldn't stop thinking about it. (laughs) Why does that sound really sexy? I'm just kidding. I mean, I have been thinking about it. I tried to make it sound sexy and see if I get a rise out of you. And I did. (laughs) That was... That was your plan? No, was it wasn't. No, no, it wasn't. No, no. I just wanted to start and say, <laughs> I've been really looking forward to this episode. Okay. I'm really excited about it. This is going to be a really good one. So this week's episode, as you have probably already seen since you press play on it, is called, Is This Your Shit or Mine? And we did a part one of this way back in the day. I think it was episode 57. Um, And we had so much fun with it. But basically what we did is we asked our Instagram community, tell us about an unresolvable issue that you and your partner are dealing with. You just have not been able to come to agreement on it. And you really can't help but wonder, like, is this my problem? Like I'm the one who needs to get over it or fix it or change something? Or is this your problem? Like you're the one who needs to change something, deal with it, get over it, whatever it is. But first, I actually have, we have like, I have an example for ourselves that I want to share, which is that, (laughs) oh no, (laughs) which is that you can't see this. Vanessa's already taking care of it. I need you to like (laughs) clean off your laptop here. I, you, I it, don't know. I don't know how this happened, to be honest it's with you. It's disgusting. It is covered it is with a full truly of dog unreal. Hair. Like, just an absolute pile of black and white dog hair from our two dogs. I don't know and how I it got on there. Like I that. can't record this episode looking over at you and just seeing Fine, so much dog hair on top of your laptop. <laughs> that one's keyboard. simple. That's, that's my shit to do. Actually, it's the dog shit to deal with. Mm. Stop shedding, you two. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cop out. Pop out. Dog's fault. Dog ate my homework. (laughs) So we've got a brand new batch of scenarios for you today. And we have not discussed them. We haven't. I've wanted to. There's There's some whoppers It's been hard not to talk about these. Yeah, Xander's been thinking about it so much. Honestly, Mm -hmm. I just read these over to get my initial impressions of like, would this be interesting enough for us to discuss in the podcast? I didn't really spend a ton of time thinking about my personal opinion about each one. So this will be oh, a little bit either. of a like, yeah, it'll be kind of a hot take episode. Like what yeah. are what are our instinctual reactions here? Oh, yeah. OK, let's get into the first one. My partner is super particular with things when it comes to sex. He wants us both to have just showered, which I totally get for oral, but sometimes I feel like it takes the spontaneity out of things. Doesn't like to do it at bedtime because he's always tired, but we have a toddler, so this is the only time that we are free. If he has eaten anything in the last two hours, he doesn't like to have sex. I get frustrated because I feel like I have to check all of these boxes to be intimate, and in previous relationships, no one was ever like that. Granted, I was younger and without kids, but even at the beginning of hours, it was way more spontaneous do i just need to be more understanding or is he being too particular and this is this was a really interesting one too Mm -hmm. because we have heard this scenario all the time Mm -hmm. but always with the woman who is the one who's more particular Uh uh-huh yeah so this one I, i thought was so fascinating that in this circumstance it's actually the guy who is more particular in a male female relationship yeah i mean it can be anyone okay so xander hot take whose shit is this to deal with all right, I'm just going to say this is like 99.9% hit shit. To That's deal a with. high percentage. I mean, yeah, maybe 99.5. <laughs> How about that? We'll leave half a half a percentage point in there. Mm, I disagree, but I think I, I agree that it's ma- the majority is hit shit. Okay, 90, 95% hit shit. <laughs> okay. How about that? <laughs> sure. Okay, great. So I, I'm not, I'm, I feel like it's not my job to be like 
you can't be particular. But I think that you have to be able to recognize if like you are a particularly particular person. Oh boy. You, I know it's a mouthful. <laughs> like it, it, you have to be able to recognize, okay, I have some over the top preferences. And as a result, like I need to take on a little bit more of the burden or the responsibility mm-hmm. to make sure that our sex life is is healthy and happening. Mm-hmm. Because it sounds to me like he is a very particular person and he's kind of like, almost like shifting the burden back to her. Like, oh yeah, this is totally normal. All these things, all these particularities that I have, like these are totally normal and it's your job to like figure out like when is an appropriate time to have sex versus him being like, okay, you know what? Like I have all these like, I have all these extra needs when it comes to sex. Mm -hmm. So I should probably take it upon myself to make sure I find ways to prioritize sex or I, you know, I take the lead in like, okay, yeah, like I would love to have sex with you. So I'm going to plan for when the shower is going to be. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, you know, let's talk in advance about, you know, the timing with the kids and when we're going to have time and, you know, what support I might need in order to have more energy. Because I feel like he's using these particularities as an excuse. Mm Mm-hmm. To yeah, avoid it, to avoid being intimate. Yeah, it feels like there's no action being taken of like, yeah, I this is what I prefer. So how do we work around this? Because something like I prefer not to have sex at night. That's a really common thing that parents tell us. Like the day is wild. We're exhausted. You're crawling into bed at the end of the night. And it's like this is the time that we're supposed to muster up even more energy and excitement mm-hmm. for having sex. So like we totally get that. But you can't just say, I don't want to have sex at night and leave it there. It has to be a conversation and a problem solving with your partner of like, okay, this is not the ideal time for me. I know our lives are really busy and full, but intimacy is important to me. You are important to me. How do we find the time or how do we find a different kind of time for us to be intimate? So if he were to say, what if we set our alarms 15 minutes earlier in the morning and try to have morning sex? Or what if we arrange to get a babysitter once a week on the weekend so we can have some afternoon delight? You know, that would be a really different kind of thing. But and, and we're not getting the full story, to be fair. And we do have to give, we always try to give our little disclaimer whenever we get audience submissions here that we are getting a tiny little snapshot of the full story. Like we don't oh, yeah. know all the details, all the history. So of course, it's easier for us to just like jump on things and, and give our opinions. But I do like to try to, you know, we both like to try to be really respectful and recognizing like these are two complex human beings. We don't know the full story of everything. But I do think there are two different kinds of particulars here. So there's, I don't want to go, I don't want to have sex at night because I'm tired. And I don't want to have sex after I've eaten because I, I don't know, presumably there's some stomach discomfort. I also like a little bit of time to digest. So like, I think these are very reasonable ones that it's just like, okay, let's see some effort around what can we do to change things. I do think like two hours is excessive. Yeah, if you're having You can have 30 minutes to digest, not two hours. Yeah, because (laughs) I mean, let's think about like, let's actually lay this out. Like if, if your requirement is no sex within two hours of eating and you eat three meals a day, like- That's basically six hours of the day plus eating time. So if you're eating for like, I mean, be generous, like 30 minutes, you know, there's like another hour and a half of eating plus then two hours after that, like you've just cut out like half of your (laughs) half of your waking day. Yeah. Right. Like if you subtract out sleep. Yeah, that is that's That's literally half the day. You're just like, oh, no, no fly zone. Yeah. Sorry, bud. two hours is too much. If you're anything like me, you really enjoy taking good care of your skin, but it's also really easy to just get overwhelmed by all the options out there. So many different products. What are you supposed to use, not use? What order do you put them in? Like it just can feel really confusing, which is why I'm so excited to introduce you to today's podcast sponsor, One Skin. Founded by an all-woman team of scientists, One Skin is the first and only skin longevity company to target cellular senescence, that is a key hallmark of aging, with their proprietary OS1 peptide. 
OS1 is scientifically proven to decrease lines and wrinkles, boost hydration, and help with the thinning skin that often comes along with age. And what is so cool about their products is it's a really simplified system. It's not a ton of different serums and moisturizers and exfoliators and all the stuff. Like it's just very simple, very effective products. You know, we always try out products before we take them on as sponsors. Like we are not willing to have a sponsor that doesn't have a product that we have tried, that we enjoy. And I've really enjoyed testing out One Skin's products. I'm super excited that for a limited time, you can try One Skin for 15% off using the code PILLOW when you check out at oneskin.co. With One Skin, your skin can stay healthy, strong, and hydrated at every age. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code PILLOW at oneskin.co. That's 15% off at oneskin.co with code PILLOW. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support Pillow Talks and let them know that we sent you. Talk to your doctor if you're having this digestive issues. Yeah, I'm. I'm but really I, curious. Is like, are these real? Yeah. Are these real issues or are these excuses, excuses. because there, there's something you have some some internalized shame around sex, something that you're not feeling comfortable mm-hmm. about? I think that so often these end up these excuses kind of like come out of the woodwork and then start to sort of expand mm-hmm. a bit where like oh yeah no like I feel like, a little uncomfortable for a little while after dinner and then all of a sudden it's like oh it's an hour it's two, two hours yeah. and it's like is there something deeper yeah. going on here but then to go back to the first thing he wants us both to have just showered that to me is a sign of internalized sexual shame and yeah. embarrassment. Like you do not need to have showered to have sex. Sex is not a dirty act. Our bodies are not dirty. Yeah, I like, mean, humans have been having, let's say, dirty sex. You know, well <laughs> before showers sex. were invented, the only way you could have sex yeah. <laughs> was not having showered. And we've done just fine as a species. Yeah, so that's like, that is something that I would not, and it sounds like she's kind of going along with it. She's like, I totally get it for oral, like even for oral. Yes, we do need to talk about like basic hygiene. Like we want to keep ourselves, you know, we want to make sure that we're having basic hygiene, but we don't need to be like vigorously showering ourselves and we definitely don't need to be soaping up our vulvas before oral, like even something very simple and easy, like a little organic unscented baby wipe, a little swipe with that, or even just taking a washcloth, putting some water on it and wiping yourself down. That's totally fine. But you don't need to do that. So it makes me a little bit bummed that she's like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. But yeah, for, you know, for both of them, I just want them to know, like, this should not be a prerequisite to sex. Yeah, prerequisite. Prerequisite. <laughs> I'm was imitating that, you. Is that Maggie I guess, talking? Yeah, I guess like the one exception is... Sometimes we hear back from people who are like, well, I or my partner has like a really um, physical job where you are Mm -hmm. like sweaty or covered in dirt or you've got, you know, trash collector, you know, that kind of stuff. We totally get that. Again, that goes more into the basic hygiene category rather than like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, we're and, you know, if you've just had a vigorous workout or, you know, been on a long run or something like we're not saying like you have to like have sex right in those moments like obviously take this with a grain of salt and like you know if you are feeling like you are pretty stinky or something because you just worked up a lot of a sweat like sure take a shower if you feel more comfortable doing that but it's not like a requirement like you're gonna get each other sick or something like it's just not not really gonna happen all right so 95 plus percent his shit on that (laughs) one our next one Okay. <laughs> Whoa. I was like, how do I start this? Okay. This next one starts with, oh my gosh. I want to make sure that you knew it was the person saying this, not me. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. My sister in law is like obsessed with my kids. She has their initials in permanent jewelry on her wrist. She posts about them on Facebook and gives updates as if they're her kids. She buys them things when I specifically ask her not to. I'm convinced that if I died, she would try to move into my house with my husband, who is her brother, and make my kids call her mom. I don't know how to tell her to back off, and I feel like my husband should, but he won't. She's 34 years old. She lives at home still. She irks me to no end, and my husband says he doesn't know what he would say. He says I should say something if it bothers me so much. My problem? 
or his? Girl. <laughs> this is we'll go back to the 95. This is 95% you. I read this one and I was like, wait, am I reading this wrong? Like your sister-in-law loves your children too much? Like that is that is not a problem. The one thing I will say, the five percent, she buys them things when I specifically ask her not to. That is not cool on the mm-hmm. sister-in-law's part. That definitely warrants a conversation. Agreed. She's crossing some boundaries there. So I would, you know, I would definitely talk to her about that and say, you know, hey, this is really important to me. This is why I don't want these things bought for my children. I'd really appreciate you honoring my boundaries. If she continues to do it, having some sort of conversation about like, you know, if my boundaries are not being respected, I will b- start doing doing XYZ. But other than that, come on. Like she loves your kids. She's a proud aunt. Yeah, and like, I assume I she doesn't have kids of her own. It sounds like not. You know, I she would lives assume not home. because she has your kids' names in permanent jewelry on her wrist. I just think that's really special for kids to have somebody other than their parents in their life who really loves them and is proud of them and wants to like brag about them and show off. Like We it, hope to be uncles and aunts like that. Yeah, I was soon. I was just about to say like maybe my bias is a little bit skewed because I am we are hopeful that we are going to become aunt and uncle uh aunt and uncle very soon and we're super excited about that and that's just that's a role that I take so seriously like I want to be a great aunt I want to be in my nieces and nephews lives of course I want to honor and respect the boundaries that their parents set I would never do something that they're you know one of my siblings specifically told me not to do so I you know I get that but like I want to love those kids so and they're not my kids you know I'm not they're going to be my nieces and nephews, not my children. But like, I want to love on those kids. And I think that this woman, I think that you are getting way too worked up about this. And like the like, she would move into my house with my like, I don't that just feels really over the top. Granted, like maybe there is some weird energy that we you know, we don't know that maybe the aunt, the sister in law, whatever is kind of being a little bit weird about it. But like, I think she just is loving those kids. Let her love the kids. Yeah. And yeah, I, I agree. I would say that this is her shit. And some of it is like, I think your shit to maybe come to some acceptance with. Like, like what's the you problem? Have a, you have a what's sister-in-law? What's the problem that she loves your kids? Yeah, like you have a sister-in-law that loves your kids in a way that maybe you don't understand. But can you accept that she may have a different type of love for your kids and you're able to understand? If you know anything about us, you know that we are absolutely obsessed with our dogs Chauncey and Maggie our two little pugs and so that's why we are so excited that Chewy is one of our newest sponsors when they say they have everything you need to keep your pet happy and healthy they they are are not not, messing around nope (laughs) they have over a hundred thousand products from all the brands your pet loves at prices that you will love food treats beds you name it they have it it gets shipped directly to your door in one to two days. The shipping is so fast. It's crazy. Also, it's not just for dogs. Also cats, birds, fish, reptiles, and more. To keep them healthy, Chewy offers pet prescriptions, pet insurance, telehealth, vet visits, and is even rolling out vet clinics across the country. And thanks to Chewy's auto ship feature, we are never going to get that we're so disappointed in you. Look from Chauncey and Maggie. We'll oh, always have the worst. a good supply of treats. Their personal favorite, which they would give their little endorsement to if they could talk, but they love the smoked marrow bones. Oh, oh yeah. my God. Absolutely obsessed. They will keep them busy for hours with one of those bones. But anyways, the auto ship feature lets you set up recurring shipments of all the essentials so you're never running out. You can change, cancel it at any time. It's just so convenient. And speaking of not worrying, Chewy has top tier 24-7 customer service. So you can get expert advice over chat or phone day and night. Plus, if your pet or you don't love something, Chewy's 100% satisfaction guarantee lets you return it within a year. No questions asked. Chewy has everything you need to keep your pet happy and healthy. And right now you can save $20 on your first order and get free shipping by going to Chewy.com slash pillows. And that's with an S, pillows. Chewy.com slash pillows to save $20 on your first order with free shipping. Chewy.com slash pillows. Minimum purchase required. New customers only. Terms and conditions apply. See site for complete details. 
Also, I think another really important thing here would be like, what is the impact on the kids? Are the kids complaining? You know, if the kids are complaining to you saying like, Aunt Rhonda's so weird. She makes me uncomfortable. Like, I obviously doubt, that's- I doubt a, they are. Yeah, but I like there's, are, no, that's not in here. there's no comment about that. Like if your kids are happy and they're like, oh, Aunt Rhonda's the coolest. Like, yeah, she has our initials on her. Like, She buys us presents <laughs> yeah. that we know you don't want us to have. Of course they love her. But I, I would, that might be a nice way for this person to like- kind of come to terms with it a bit. It's like, look at the impact it's having yeah. on your kids. Yeah. I mean, I there's a couple things. So I want to say, I think it is her shit. Now, I think that if you really want to be like to talk to your sister-in-law about this, there are a couple. Uh, I think one, it's your responsibility to have that conversation with her, reg- like regardless of what the conversation is, because it kind of sounds like your husband doesn't quite agree with you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. that his sister is is over the top with it. I think that there's a couple things that you could talk to her about if you really wanted to. I'm going to be generous here. So the, you know, the posting about them on Facebook, you know, I do know like different parents have different philosophies about like That's their true. kids boundaries. and social media, yeah. boundaries with social media. You know, I know some of my friends who are parents, like they are very insistent on like not posting. Well, I mean, it's not about not posting pictures of their kids, but it's about not tagging their kids in photos because they they don't want there to be like a history of like, oh, here's 500 photos of this person that are already on Facebook once they get a Facebook account and start interacting with friends. Like they want their kids to be able to like start from scratch with Mm -hmm. social media just like we did. Some people say, you know what, I don't want to post photos of my kids on social media also i'm curious what your own philosophy with social is if it she conflicts with say this, anything about I it doubt, so like yeah, I, I i doubt, I doubt about that's that. it but but if, that is a valid boundary i mean you know if you want to rethink your own thought if you want to rethink your own rethink philosophy your your, yeah, rethink your thoughts on social media and make a change that's an avenue to talk to her about hey i'd like to tone this down or stop doing this because I'm, you know, I'm stopping doing this too, you know, I, I, you know, I, for whatever reason. So I think that's one area. And then the second area that Vanessa already mentioned is the buying gifts that mm-hmm. you've, you've told her not to do. Like, that's really important because it undermines you know, your, your authority as a parent and your, like, you know, your ability to, you know, teach your kids whatever boundaries or, you know, lessons around like money and gifts that you want to be able to do. So that's a definite valid conversation to be had. But I think it's got to be a conversation that's kind of based on like logic and boundaries of like, hey, these are the limits of like what I want to be able to do. It's not going to be very effective if you're just like, yo, stop buying presents for my kids. You are not allowed to buy presents for my kids. Like that's probably not going to be successful. Okay, the one thing that I do disagree with you on, though, and then we'll move on from this one, but right. the you said that it's her shit to deal with, not her husband's. I do think that when in-laws are at play, the person who's like family that is should be involved okay so it's like uh, it's it's his sister i do think you know we're all adults we have our individual relationships like i do think we should get comfortable communicating with people directly and i do think when it's like your family that's involved part of like being a good teammate to your partner is being willing to be a part of that with them so i think the two of them need to have a conversation first and she needs to express to her husband like why she's upset about the you know this the gifts um, and if he, you know, we get him on the same team about that, and then he potentially could have that first conversation with the sister about like, hey, yeah. you know, if we specifically tell you not to buy X, Y, Z, please don't buy it. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Once you pointed that, that out to me. Yeah, I think everything I said about the avenues for how you could talk to her, I think ideally, you want to get on the same page with your husband about that. Okay, what is our approach to social media and our kids? What are our boundaries or rules around gifts? And then, you know, hey, so I'm noticing that your sister is a bit out of line with these things. Let's, I would like us to have a conversation together. I don't think it's fair to just be like, hey, your sister bugs me. Deal with it. Oh, yeah. No, not at all. So, but yeah, it's more of a, hey, let's get on the same page about this. And I think also at this point, you're going to have to acknowledge to your husband, you know, her brother, hey, you know, I know that I've been complaining a lot about her or, you know, we've kind of had disagreements about like, 
you know, what I would like for you to say to her and you haven't done it. I want to set mm-hmm. that stuff aside. I've been thinking about it some more. And like, I really appreciate that she loves our kids and wants to be in their lives. Mm-hmm. There are a couple of things that I am taking some issue with. And I think that it would be helpful for us, not you, us to have a conversation with her about. And these are the specific things. Outside of that, I'm like really glad that she loves our kids and and whatnot. Because if you don't acknowledge that, your husband is going to filter it through the past experience, which is, oh, you know, my wife just like really hates my sister and is like, (laughs) you know, just kind of like unreasonably mad at her about things. So you got to acknowledge, you know, hey, I've been a little over the top in the past, but these these are some real things that I want to talk about. Okay, next up. So, my husband has a foot fetish. Not the extreme type, but likes to physically touch and interact with them sexually. He confided this in me maybe nine months into dating, and I didn't judge him for it. I accepted it and welcomed him to explore it, and I didn't want him to have to suppress it any longer. I was never a big fan of it, though. I cringe whenever he wants to touch or interact with them. In all truth, I hate it. I don't enjoy it, and he wants me to so badly. I have gotten so close to just telling him to never touch them again. But then he always expresses to me how much this is a part of him and his sexuality. He's never pressured me to continue to let him engage, but I almost feel like I have to. What kind of person would I be to not allow him to express his fairly harmless fetish? But also, I cannot stand it, and it does nothing for me sexually and he wants me to keep trying because he's convinced that it will one day we've fought countless times and have come to no resolve we're even thinking about seeking counseling if i truly won't allow him to engage in what he feels he needs sexually what am i supposed to do just suck it up and do it oh this one like starts to take a turn for me the more I the more I read it, yeah. the more it was like, like she says, oh, he doesn't pressure me, he's so kind about it. But then it's like, wait, but, but you've thought does. countless times about it. And he's he convinced keeps telling that, you that, yeah, he's convinced that you will like it one day. Now you're thinking of going to counseling. Like, it oh, yeah. does feel like he is pressuring you. And also earlier on, I mean, she's like, I accepted it and welcomed it. But then you're like, actually, I, I hate it. And I cringe. And like, well, that doesn't quite sound like acceptance. To me, so I think it sounds like both of these people have an idea in their head about how this should be or how they want to be. And then they're bumping up against the realities of like what they actually really want or don't want deep down. I think she's saying I accept it. Like I'm not judgmental of it, which to be totally clear, you and I are not judgmental of it either. Mm -hmm. Like fetishes are very normal. They're very common. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. But I think that she's saying like there's a difference between, you know, my logical, rational acceptance of it and then my actual experience in the moment of like, I just don't enjoy having my feet touched in a sexual way. Yeah. Okay. So Xander, whose shit is this? Oh, this is hard. I mean, I'm going to say it's kind of a, there's shit on both sides. Oh, I'm going to say there's shit on both sides. Okay. I, I think it's his shit to deal with. Huh. Okay. I was actually, my original thing, I was going to say, I think this is more her shit oh. to deal with. Because look, I mean, okay, let's start from the beginning. It sounds like he confided in her. Oh, actually, though, I don't know. Nine months. I, I don't I don't know. There's no like right number. Like, oh, after X number of months, you need to disclose something. Nine months is a while. I'm I'm not sure if they were sexually active for nine months or they were, you know, maybe together for a while and not sexually active. But like, it's, I mean, it's it's a long time to be in a relationship for nine months before you drop something on your partner like that about like your sexual preferences. So that is a little tricky that, you know, hey, that might have been something that would have been valuable or important to disclose earlier on, I think that, you know, some people can feel hesitant to want to share something early on because they're convinced that they're going to get dumped Mm -hmm. as a result. And so thinking, oh, well, the longer I wait, the longer I wait, the better my chances are that they will. But I mean, well, in really what's going on is, is a kind of, you know, can be a manipulative way of, well, once I, you know, we really get so close that they feel like, they can't leave. Mm, it's tough. Sometimes people, I mean, we just, it's okay to take time to divulge things to people yeah. too. That, no, no, it, absolutely. So it, it, it's a gray area. I would say nine months is, okay, it's but tricky. But tell me then, why you think this is her shit though. 
Well, so I don't know. She said he confided this nine months in. I'm curious how long it's been now past that. I think it's been a while because she's talking about countless fights. And they're, date, they're married. To, yeah, they're married. So I, I think what's her shit is like, I mean, it sounds like fairly cl- from fairly close to the beginning, she knew that she was not into this and that it was, she was cringing and she really hated it. She doesn't want to interact sexually in that way. So you know, I think in some regards, like, that is something, you know, that that's an, a key element of their relationship that she didn't take action on earlier. Oh, God, I, I disagree with you so hard on this one. I mean, you have to like, I mean, relationships are, are hard. You can't just like, bury your head in the sand of like, oh, there's this thing that I really don't like, but and especially like a sex thing, like a kink where a fetish where like it's not going to go away. Like where she like what what was she thinking? Oh, maybe this just will turn into a non-issue. Maybe Wild. this will go okay. away. I, I think that she was trying her fucking best to be a good partner and say like, OK, I get this. It's not my thing, but I'm not mm-hmm. judging you for it. I want you to explore it. I'm willing to give it a shot. Like she really gave it a mm-hmm. shot and she she gave it too much of a shot. Like yeah. way earlier, she should have had a conversation with him and told him like, I'm so sorry. You know, I really I respect this about you. I really gave it my best. But like, it's just not something that I'm into. And I don't like, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable continuing to do it anymore. Yeah. But I like I think that she she was a great partner, like trying so hard to make it work. And I think that he needs to accept now that like, look, she gave it a fair shot. She's not into it. Not only is she not, because there's a difference. Sometimes we can be like, hey, this isn't my jam, but it, you know, if it brings you pleasure, that brings me pleasure. I'm fine with it. Versus somebody saying like, I'm trying this for you and I'm so uncomfortable and I really dislike it and it doesn't feel safe to me. It doesn't feel good to me. It gives it makes me cringe. Like that's a big difference. Yeah. Like she actively dislikes this. And so for him to say, like it yes it is true that for a lot of you know for people who have fetishes a lot of people who have fetishes not necessarily all of them for a lot of people who do like it can feel like this is a central part of my identity and my expression and the thought of not being able to do it with my life partner is really scary and hard that is absolutely true but he can't use that as I really do think that he is pressuring her and like to say oh, yeah. you'll I'm convinced you will like it one day no she's not going to like it one day so i think they i he needs to stop he needs to accept like she's what's happening here is she's saying no and he <laughs> you want to take it back don't you <laughs> no i don't i actually don't she, okay. i want to point something out oh, to you no okay let me no. so i think she's saying no and he's like yes yes let's keep doing it you will like it one day like that's gross to me that's not okay so i do think like they are in a very difficult position here and i have a lot of compassion for both of them because this is not a resolvable problem she should not continue doing this he is allowed to want it to desire it to feel like that's a central part of his identity and i think that he needs to make the decision now of okay i respect my partner's no just the same way she has respected my fetish and i have to decide what do i want do i want to be able to explore this aspect of my sexuality and continue expressing it or do i want to be with my partner and not get to express it and that's a horrible decision to have to make it's really hard and again i have a lot of sympathy for him but i think it's on him to make that decision she this is not zero to do with her in my opinion We have a special treat for you today. We're joined by our friend Liz Moody, host of the Liz Moody podcast. Liz is a longtime journalist who shares real science, real stories, and realistic tools that actually level up every part of your life. Liz has already shared three amazing tips with us, so make sure to check out our last three episodes if you missed any of those. And today, she's back with tip number four. So Liz, what is lucky number four? Lucky number four is to fight Right. So I think we think a lot about what we want to do in our relationships when things are going really well. How can we feel even closer to our partner? How can we level up our sex lives? Things like that. But what do we do when we're actually in these moments where 
we have some conflict, when things are a little bit trickier. I had doctors John and Julie Gottman on the podcast there, some of the world's leading minds in couples therapy. They've done incredible research in the subject. You guys know them. They, they blurbed your book, didn't they? They did. That was such a huge honor. It was incredible. Yeah. I, I remember when I saw that on your book cover and I was like, Vanessa, <laughs> that's wild. They're just, they're absolutely iconic. And it was such an honor to get to sit down with them. And they shared all of the science behind how you can have bites that actually improve your relationship. So one of the facts that they shared is that you have 180 seconds to kick off a fight successfully. You want to start a fight with, here's how I feel. Here's what I need versus what many of us go to, which is a criticism or a put down. They actually demonstrate in the episode what a good version of a fight looks like and what a less successful version of a fight looks like. But really paying attention to that first 180 seconds is key to having a fight that's going to actually enhance your relationship. Yeah, that is a great episode. They What they do so well is making really practical like relationship wisdom and tidbits. Like the, They call that the soft startup too, but stuff like that. It just is so simple and easy to do. All right, so next time we get into a conflict, I'm going to start a three-minute timer and say, all right, we're on the <laughs> clock, babe. I love it too because they're about very similar things to what we're about, which is we're distilling all of this research, all of this science, and we're saying, what do I actually do with this in the moment to make my life feel the way that I want it to feel every single day? And so I love taking all of this research and turning it into action steps for people, which is what we do on every single podcast. So that's one of my favorite tips. They share a lot of other tools and techniques for fighting. The episode is called Fighting Can Make Your Relationship Better If You Do It This Way. That is such a good episode. We will put the link to it in our show notes so you can find it really easily and check it out. And make sure to come back next week to hear the fifth and final tip from Liz. I agree with everything you said, but I think what is what I keep coming back to is I, I, when I read this, I don't think that she has had that clear conversation with him yet. And I think that that's where, if she has had that clear conversation with him, you know what, dude, I tried really long and really hard. I, you know, I've tried in all these different ways. And the, the bottom line is no matter how we slice it, I can't get my head around enjoying this in the way that it seems like you want me to be able to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just not open to it. I don't think she's had that conversation with him. So it's like, that's... I don't... But what what would they be fighting about then? Well, I don't know. But she's saying, oh, I've gotten so close to telling him to never touch them again. Um, I think that they're talking around the issue. I don't know. If she's saying we've know. had countless fights, like the fight would not be him being like, you're going to enjoy it. And her being like... Uh, maybe like <laughs> well I guess I don't I guess I don't I guess I don't know yeah. um so I mean I guess my 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 advice is I think that to into this person I think you know yeah the, if you we can litigate the past and it looks like uh, it seems like there's all kinds if we keep looking back there's all kinds of places where he could have he could have should have done something you could have should have done something like could have had these conversations earlier you know, he could have told you about this earlier. So it didn't feel like, oh, my God, like nine months in and like I'm super into this person. And like now I'm finding this out. There's all kinds of things that could have could have would have happened earlier. But the reality is right now. I think that you got to ask yourself, have you had this really clear bottom line conversation with him about this of like, I've done everything I can and more. And I still don't get why that makes us her shit, though. I I think it's both of their shit. <laughs> okay. Like, I mean, I think that it sounds to me like when he told her this nine months into their relationship that she was kind of like, okay, yeah, like I, I, I'm open to this. I accept this. Like, let's give it a try. And I what I don't know is like she's she's obviously given it a lot of tries. But has she now been really clear? You know what? I'm just, I've tried so much and I'm not into this. And I think that if you say you're going to give something a try, then you he, have to be able to communicate to the person after you're done trying that, you know what, hey, this isn't working. He for me. knows that she doesn't like it because 
it says he is convinced that I will like it one day. Oh yeah, no, and that, so that's he knows fucked she up. Like oh, it. that that's fucked up. I'm gonna say that is his shit. Like that's that's unacceptable to be like, oh, you're gonna like this. You're gonna that's like this. You just gotta you just gotta do okay. it more. Yeah, that's that is not cool. Um, so I think I, I, it's both of their shit. I mean, they've worked themselves into quite a mess here. Both of them. Man. Okay. Well, I want you, the listener, to come let us know because I feel like we've done a lot of advice types of things and we are almost always on the same page. I feel like I have not disagreed with you more <laughs> than I have on this one. So I want to hear what you guys think. Like, come over to Instagram. We're at Vanessa and Xander and let us know whose shit you, th- whose shit you think this foot fetish situation is. I mean, I feel like the, the real bottom line here with with this kind of thing where it's like if, if this is central to his sexual identity for him to feel satisfied she is a hard pass on engaging in this activity one or both of them has to decide like if this is a deal breaker and, he, and walk I, away i think he has to decide it and and yeah and i Yes, I think it's his guess, decision. She's yeah. saying I don't want to do it. Anymore. Okay, if yeah, if she's if she's really clearly said that to him, then yeah, it's hundred percent. It's hundred percent his shit. He's got to decide. You know, he's got to you know shit or get off the pot, so to speak. Um, yeah, I just always get really sensitive in situations where I hear a woman feeling like she doesn't have agency or feeling that she doesn't have choice when it comes to sex. Like yeah. reading these little things, selling, tell, you know, of her saying like, I feel like I can't not do it. I feel like I just need to suck it up and do it. Like, you know, it just makes me feel really sensitive. And I want I want everybody, people of all genders, to know that we are always allowed to make our own decisions and have our own boundaries when it comes to sex. And I get that she loves him deeply. I really, I respect that she respects his fetish and doesn't judge him for it and like wants him to be able to express it. But I don't want her sacrificing herself, her boundaries, her sense of safety, her pleasure in order to fulfill him. And again, it's it's a really hard situation to be in because I respect that if this feels like it's a really central part of his expression but i think this is completely on him at this point to decide what he wants to do here well i mean or on her to like decide if you know i mean she could decide today to like walk away from oh this. yeah yeah like, she could and, and but i and but she I think- could have made that decision a long time i'm not saying it's her fault for not making that decision i'm just it's so tricky the the verbiage of like your shit or mine i mean your shit when i'm saying you've had the ability to make this decision for a long time like but her decision is not stay or go her decision is do i want to participate in this or not she wants to be with him she mm-hmm. loves him this is her husband he's the one saying well but this thing is so important to me i can't imagine living my life yeah. not expressing this so i don't think she has a decision to make here other than like i don't want to engage in the fetish mm-hmm. anymore all right yeah well i i just want to make sure if she said that super clearly to him then it's 100 percent his shit Oof, I cannot wait to hear what our Instagram I, do, I just don't know. I mean, this. honestly, I'm just curious when you, you know, to the listener, if you listen through, when you listen to what she wrote in, does it feel to you like she's really clearly laid it out in the kind of like bottom line way or not? I, I didn't read it that way. I read that it feels I, I, I worry that they've both been tiptoeing around it because they both know what's at stake. They both know that likely they are going to have to divorce and walk away from each other because it's just not going to work. And I worry that they're both tiptoeing around it. Mm. And that's how I read it. And that, that's what I was, that's where I was responding from. Chances are the talk your parents had with you wasn't great. Maybe you sat through a painfully uncomfortable conversation about the perils of sex before marriage, heard some questionable sex facts from your friends at school, or watched your high school science teacher do wild things to a banana. Or maybe you never even got a talk at all. You probably wouldn't be here if you hadn't already experienced the harmful impact that this lack of a proper sex education had on your own life. And we know you want better for your kids. You want them to have a healthy relationship with intimacy and sex, to feel confident and secure in their own skin, to know when to say no and when to say yes, to know how to keep their bodies and their hearts safe. So we want to help you have the talk with your kids in a way you're proud of and equip them with the shame-free, confidence-boosting knowledge that they deserve. That's why we've been busy at work behind the scenes building our newest product, How to Talk to Your Kids About Sex. 
We cover everything from when to start, age-appropriate information for every stage, how to balance wanting them to take sex seriously without making them feel shame, and tricky topics like porn, consent, and staying safe from abuse. All the material is easily skimmable and comes with dozens of specific scripts you can copy when your kid asks you the tough questions like, will it hurt and is it normal to masturbate? Join now for exclusive early bird pricing and receive our course, Rediscovering Us, Intimacy and Sex for Parents, absolutely free. That's $199 value, even more than the price of the course. But you have to get in before August 31st. Check out the show notes for this episode or go to vmtherapy.com slash talks. All right, well, let's leave the foot fetish and move on. All right, our next one. I grew up with a dad who had a lot of unchecked anger that has had lasting effects on me and my sisters. I married a man who is so patient and slow to anger, except as we have had kids. Stress and overwhelm shows up as anger in his parenting. It used to be worse where I needed to intervene. Never physical or emotional abuse, but made me uncomfortable. And now is much better. However, he still goes to anger much more than I want, i.e., This morning, our six-year-old had an accident sleeping in our bed, and he yelled at her. Should part of me just accept that he is forging his own relationship with our kids, and I am forging my own, and let them be different, my stuff or his? Also, I want to add that we have already discussed this in general, and he thinks we just have different parenting styles. Ooh, this is another easy one for me. I think this is his shit to deal with. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, so I think, okay... When you grow up in an environment where there is a lot of a certain emotion being expressed, like anger. She grew up with a lot of anger in the house. You naturally develop a higher tolerance for anger because you're just around it all the time. So something like a you know child who grew up where anger was not expressed in a household and a child where anger was expressed, like the one where there was a lot of anger, like you're not going to get as uncomfortable in other situations, whereas somebody who didn't grow up with that is going to be like, whoa, what is going on? And I also, before I get any further, I want to say anger itself is not a bad emotion. I don't believe that there are such things as bad emotions. Like there's information behind anger and there are a lot of other emotions underneath anger. Anger is often like it presents, it's the loudest, showiest emotion, but it tends to not actually be what the real feeling is. Especially Often, for men. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. We yeah, could do a where, whole that's other where I was go. episode that's, on that. That's the red herring for me in this one. Yeah. I mean, men are taught that anger is one of the few emotions that they're allowed to express. So most men go to anger when they're actually feeling sadness, fear, anxiety. It just is so much easier to like go on that angry path. So all that to say, I think, you know, because this is so interesting. Listen to what she says. He is so patient and slow to anger, except as we have had kids, stress and overwhelm show up as anger in his parenting. Like, That doesn't, he's not a patient, slow to anger person if she's saying this is coming up all the time. And she's saying to the point where I needed to intervene, it made me uncomfortable. Yeah. But she's leading with, he's so patient and slow to anger. Somebody who is patient and slow to anger does not scare you, does not make you uncomfortable, does not make you need to intervene. So I want her to kind of check herself and recognize, ooh, my barometer about what anger like levels of anger might be a little bit off because I was raised in a traumatic environment that had a lot of anger. This is an angry man. You know, well, I don't want to put a label on him like that. This is a man who is struggling with With his anger anger, and he needs some help with this. This is not a circumstance around like, oh, this is him forging his own relationship with his children. This is somebody who is struggling with his own emotions and needs help. He needs therapy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, because we know he is a man and we you know know that men are typically socialized to not show emotion. And so like Vanessa said, when anger is one of the few acceptable or even or sometimes even celebrated emotions oh, yeah. in men, what will happen is, you know, the your kind of like brain goes, oh, my God, I'm, I'm feeling an emotion. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to process this. Okay, we'll do anger. I know anger. 
And so it will come out as anger. And so what this is telling me is, okay, so you may have thought that this was a really patient and slow to anger person. Now you have kids and, you know, you're, you know, kind of like your world has been turned upside down. And what is what this is telling you is your partner is having a lot of feelings about about being a parent. He doesn't know what those feelings are. You don't know what those feelings are if your partner's only, you know, showing anger. So your partner has some work to do to mm-hmm. try to figure out okay, how can I identify what is actually coming up for me in these situations so that I can identify, okay, what is really sadness? What is really fear? What is really shame? And what is actually anger? Because anger is a valid and useful emotion in the right situation. The problem Mm -hmm. is, um, you know, it's sort of like boy who cried wolf, where it's like, you know, if all you do is this one thing, then eventually when you actually need that thing, No one is going to know if it's real or but, not. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's like he's taking his anger out on the children. Yeah. And that's not fair. It's not safe. It's traumatizing the kids. It's going to have lasting impacts on them yeah. and their lives. Like, he needs to learn better emotional regulation. Yeah, and I don't think it's really, like, it doesn't make sense to me to be like, oh, okay, well, mom and dad are just going to have completely different parenting styles. Like, I think that when you are co-parenting and especially yeah. married yep. on, in the same household like you need to come to some agreement on what the parenting style is what's the point of having a parenting style if you both have opposite parenting styles mm-hmm. all you're going to do is like teach your kids okay well i go to mom in this situation because it's more beneficial to me i go to dad in that situation because it's, it's more kids. beneficial to me it's confusing and then ultimately it probably ends up just driving a wedge mm-hmm. between, between everybody and kind of undermining you each undermine yeah. your own individual parenting approaches. So I don't think it's really fair to be like, oh, okay, yeah, we're just going to do totally different things. All right, let's move on to the next one. I like for each of these, I could talk for the whole episode, but we had so many great submissions. I want to keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. I'm in a new relationship and my partner is uncomfortable that I still communicate with my ex whom I was in a relationship with for 15 years. Great use of whom. I was about to say that. that. (laughs) Great use. Great whom usage. I mean, it's it's appropriate. It's grammatically correct. But you never see whom anymore. And and I I love a good whom. I feel like one of the only ones. I feel really hoity-toity sometimes. Yeah. There's some situations where it, it looks so ridiculously it sticks out like a sore thumb and i'm like tech i know it's grammatically correct here but it's gonna look so (laughs) ridiculous here's the trick though is in order to decide if it's who or whom you reread the sentence and you try to see would i answer it with him or he so i was in a relationship would you say i was in a relationship with him for 15 years or i was in a relationship with he for 15 years that's such a convoluted way to figure i have such a simpler way to decide this no you say him so whom you you add yeah. because of that m you add the m for the whom yeah well it's so i mean my, the trick. way i do it is you say um i still you know my partner's uncomfortable that i still communicate with my ex whom i was in a relationship with for 15 years so so what is right before the whom it's my ex so key that's that's your ex and then the next word i was in the relationship so the subject of that next clause like I was in a relationship with, if the X and I are different, then it's whom. And if it's if it's the same person. I think person, my trick is easier. I don't know. I think Come my over to easier. Instagram and let us know what grammar trick you think is better. Whom, him, who, he, who. Uh, also, I've been noticing this happening so much lately. My other grammar trick for when to know if you say Xander and I versus Xander and me. Everybody says Xander and I or like him and I, because we think like that's the correct usage. Mm -hmm. It's not true. No, it's sometimes Xander and me. So you have to do the sentences separately. I know. I do that one. (laughs) That's a good one. I do that one the same. uh, I need an example sentence. Uh, This podcast is hosted by Xander and I. Would you say this podcast is hosted by I? No, that doesn't sound. This podcast is hosted by me. So it's this podcast is hosted by Xander and me. However, Vanessa and I host this podcast. Yes. And just like I host this podcast. Just like in this example, if it is, um, (laughs) um, I still communicate with my ex whom I was in a relationship with 15 years. That's whom. But if you said, 
that I still communicate with my ex who was in a relationship with me for 15 years, that would be correct. <laughs> who knew that you'd be learning grammar in a sex and relationship? Did you know that we were so good we're, at grammar? I'm actually both, better. I'm better than Vanessa. You, I have better, like I have just instinctually really good grammar. You can describe <laughs> all the re- <laughs> No, I just, I just know how to do it. I just write it. But you will have like the, the proper explanation oh like oh that's the subject and the object and i'm like i barely even know what's the subject and the object but i can write it properly mm-hmm. but we bond a lot over our grammar nerds so. <laughs> okay let's continue <laughs> okay so sh- this Wait, person started, started over at the top okay okay this person we don't know their gender here this person is in a new relationship their partner is uncomfortable that they still talk to their ex we mainly talk about my dog, but my new partner is upset that I haven't cut him out of my life completely. Haven't cut the ex. I can completely understand where he's coming from, but I also don't think I should have to cut my ex out of my life just because my new partner wants me to. So it's kind of that the classic question, like, am I allowed to keep talking to my ex when I'm in a new relationship? Is that a hot take? A hot take. This is 100% your partner's shit. Yeah. They, they got to suck this up. Uh, assuming there's nothing more going on than what you've described here. You're, yeah, I mean, you're, if you're, you're having like, an affair with them, then like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> you're if you're sending dog pics and dick pics, like that's a different <laughs> dog with they a side of dick. dick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dick in the background. Yeah, It's, it's like a, a close up on the dog's face and there's just like a little dick looming in the background. Oh my God, like, like where's Waldo? <laughs> So or it's if, like you holding the dog, but you're yeah, but you're naked. naked. <laughs> yeah, if you're sending nudes with your dogs, you know that's not okay. However, if you're clothed, no dicks, no other genitalia involved. Like if you're communicating about a dog, and that's the majority for communication. You were together for 15 years. I'm guessing that you probably shared custody of those dogs when yeah. you were together. Like. I mean, if you swap out dogs for like kids, like had you had kids with that ex or something, like your partner's gonna be like, no, you can never talk to the to the father of your children. Mm-hmm. Like that's absurd. So no, I, I think that this person needs to, to figure out how to deal with whatever feelings of jealousy are coming up for them. There's a reason that you're not in a relationship anymore. There's a reason why you are with this person. Like, if you had wanted to be with your ex, you would have never broken up. Yeah. So this person has got to find a way to get yeah. through some of those feelings. I mean, if heaven forbid something happened with us and we were no longer in a relationship together, like I would, it would be very important for me and you to be in communication about our dogs because we love them so much. (laughs) I know. And also that this person is just like, all that we're really talking about is the dog. It's like, there's not, of course, if there was a situation where they were worried about some emotional infidelity or emotional affair going on, like we're, you know, reminiscing about the past or sharing pictures of our, you know, memories together. Of our dicks. Of our dicks. (laughs) Yeah, that would be, (laughs) that would be a problem. But if, if all you're doing is like sending cute dog pics and like, hey, hope you're well, especially with somebody that you were with for 15 years this was not a like six months together kind of thing like this person was a significant part of your life like you're allowed to continue having them in your life yeah you didn't crazy that your partner wants yeah they didn't say anything about this i'm going to assume the way this is written it sounds like probably a relatively amicable breakup no like strife now if it was like we were in a relationship for 15 years and he was abusing the shit out of me all 15 years and I finally got out of that relationship but I still send him dog pictures because like you know they were his dogs too maybe your new partner has a bit of a point of like hey this doesn't feel very healthy that you're still in communication with this person there is none of that I'm yeah. not seeing any of that in here so yeah of course like if there is something really messed up going on or some messed up reason why you guys broke up or he you know did something to you sure but if it's really just amicable, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, just be adults here. All right, our next one. One major one for us is surrounded in the idea that my partner is a fitness coach and I am the one who struggles with consistency in the gym or with health goals. Intuitively eating and listening to my body is something I strive to do. But that in some seasons has led me to resorting to lots of rest, overeating, and leads to me not feeling good about myself. 
My partner walks a fine line of being supportive, but then also I feel like I'm being coached. We always struggle with the balance of having someone to hold me accountable, but not to feel like I'm being watched or criticized. Is it my job to let him hold me accountable and to get over my insecurities of feeling criticized? Or is it his job to let go of being a coach and watch me be unhappy with my habits? Oh, this is a really good one. Okay. On the surface, it seems like a simple one, but I think there I actually are answer. there are a lot of layers here. So I do think... I think that the problem, I think that this is kind of equally your shit. Oh, interesting. I disagree with you. Okay. So I think that the main problem here is that they haven't really had a clear discussion on roles. So it's like, do you want your partner to be your fitness coach or not? Like, if you want them to be your coach and to like, So first of all, I would recommend not. I think that's a, especially if it's caused issues for you in your relationship in the past. Like that's just a really difficult role for your partner to play. Like I get that they probably have some skill in this area because they do that for their job. But it's really different when you're coaching somebody. It's just like I would never be Xander's therapist. That would be insane. (laughs) And uh, there are rules against that. I think I don't think there are any rules about being your partner's fitness coach. But like it is, it's just complicated to have to train your partner. So I feel like these two got into this situation without very clearly saying like, hey, I need some help in this area. I would like you to be my coach. If they are going to insist on him being the coach, then I think they need to get really clear about the type of coaching that I don't think we know this person's gender, the type of of coaching that they want to have yeah. like do they like somebody to hold them accountable do they like some tough love because it sounds like no it sounds like the the partner's like his way of being a fitness coach doesn't really work for this person so i just feel like why then why are you having him show up as that role but then what makes this more complicated for me <laughs> Is the is it his job to watch me be unhappy with my habits? Like I do get because this person is causing themselves a, a, some issues. Like they're saying I'm overeating. I don't feel good about myself. Like they're not in a great place with their own like you know wellness and well being. So I think it is really tricky to watch your partner struggle and you know not take good care of themselves and be unhappy in their own skin. So I get that that yeah that feels challenging, but I don't know. I think it's equally. What what's your thought? I mean, I think the the Xander's problem, like chomping at the bit over here. I'm like, let me say, let me say. <laughs> just to address what you were just saying at the end, I, I think the problem there is there. But at least the person writing in, I don't know about the the husband co- or partner, the guy who's a coach. But it sounds like they are falling into the trap of thinking there are only two extreme possibilities of, oh, you just got to sit back and watch me suffer and like be miserable. Or I'm your coach and I'm going to like get you through this and mm-hmm. it's my way or the highway. And there are a whole range of options in the middle there. Like... You know, you you don't need to coach your partner, but you can absolutely be like, hey, I'm seeing that you're really struggling right now. And, you know, and I I feel sad. I want to be able to support you or, you know, support you in whatever you need, whether it's me helping or getting somebody else who can help or whatever. You know, what can I do? Can we think about eating healthier and I can cook more, whatever. Like there's such a range of options. I feel like you're both falling into this trap of like, it's all, it's all or nothing. Like it's either he's the coach hundred percent of the time, or like he just sits back and kind of, you know, like wipes his hands clean of Mm -hmm. any responsibility. And no, like it's, I think the answer is somewhere, somewhere in the middle, but going back, like to me, yeah, I, I agree that, that yeah, it's important that they have a conversation about what kind of role the, the person writing in wants, you know, how much they want to be coached, what type of role the partner should be playing in coaching. That's a, a valid conversation. But at the end of the day, I, I think it should be kind of like you shouldn't come into a relationship being like, this is my profession and the very first thing I'm going to do in our relationship is start like being your coach or being your doctor or being you know, whatever your profession is. Like, I think the general assumption should not be like, let's go into a relationship hard in like me. I don't know, like having a romantic and a professional relationship with my partner. So I think that I would say this is more his shit 
than the person writing in because mm -hmm. I don't think it's I don't think it's a great assumption to be like, okay, cool, yeah, I'm just going to start coaching the shit out of my partner who doesn't necessarily seem to love it. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's more his shit. But you, yeah, you got to have that conversation of just like, this is the, you know, these are the boundaries of what I'm okay with. All right, let's move on to our final one of the day. My wife had multiple affairs years ago. We are still together. She likes to go out partying with my sister, who introduced her to all of the affairs. Most of the time, she ends up staying the night at men's houses who are my sister's quote-unquote friends. I told her I'm uncomfortable with her going out and staying the night at men's houses, but she <laughs> says I'm being controlling, that I just want her to go to work, come home, and not have a social life. Am I wrong? Am I controlling? Is it me? Am I the problem? <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to give you some tough love here. Yes, you are the problem. Oh. Because you need to leave. Like, this is this is not a healthy relationship for you. You're the problem. I mean, you, you probably should have left, you know, years ago when your wife had multiple affairs. You probably should have left when she's spending the night at random men's houses. Like, I mean, I, I think that this has crossed a line probably yeah, a long time a long ago. Time ago. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that, yes, yeah, so at the end of the day, you are totally in the right. I think it is very reasonable to ask your wife, hey, when you're going out partying with your sister, I don't feel comfortable with you spending the night at men's houses. I don't even know that presumably you just met. I think that that is totally fair. <laughs> now, your partner has a very different perspective that no, I, you know, that, that, you know, despite all these things that happened in the past, I'm going to continue operating in this way like so if you had said oh well we've never actually talked about it before i just am scared i would say yeah you got to talk about it but it sounds like you've talked about this a lot and your partner just has a very different viewpoint than you do around like what are the limits or boundaries in in a, a, a committed relationship and i think that those boundaries have been repeatedly broken and it's probably time to leave yeah, this one is, I, I I was like, I read this one multiple times. I was like, am I reading this incorrectly? Like, she's spending the night at other people's houses after being up partying, after, you know, she had affairs with, in like, very similar situations with your sister's friend. Like, this this was wild. Yeah, now, yeah. unless you're in a different relationship, you're not in a monogamous, committed situation sure, and there, like are, there are. are other you know you are operating under a different relationship configuration that you didn't write here maybe no. i don't know but i don't think so because you said multiple affairs so you know if you were in more of an open yeah. thing you wouldn't necessarily call it that so I, i'm trying to be generous here yeah and i also want to be clear like i think we both think that it's totally okay to have friends of the gender that you're attracted to like this is not a like oh she shouldn't even be like talking to other people like it's fine if they genuinely are friends but the like spending the night at random men's houses like after they've been partying like that's just that's not cool and yeah for her to the way that she's like lashing out and saying like you're being controlling that you just want her to go to work, come home, and not have a social life. Like, it's just too much. Yeah, this poor person. Like, you... You, you deserve are, better. You deserve better than you this. You deserve different. It is, it is... It's time to walk away. Oh, man. Well, we have to stop here. We have so many other ones that we didn't have time to get to well, today, but we just... Do more. We, we have to do stop. So, we would love to know if you like this episode, if you like this format. So, please come on over to Instagram. We're at Vanessa and Xander, and let us know uh, what you think. And if you did love this episode, please give us a five-star review. If you're on Apple Podcasts, go to our main Pillow Talks podcast page. Give us a five-star review all the way down to the bottom and leave a little written review because those written reviews help us reach new people so much. And in fact, we're so appreciative of anyone who leaves a written review that we do a review of the week and giveaway every week where if you hear your review read out loud... Send us a little a DM on Instagram and we will give you a little masterclass as a prize. So this week's review of the week. So if you hear this and this is you, 
come DM us. Road trip. I recently discovered your podcast and added a few episodes to a playlist for a 14-hour road trip. <laughs> 14 hours. Oh, my God. Halfway through the first episode, my friend pa- pressed pause and said, I already have so many nuggets I've tucked away to talk about with my partner. We listened almost exclusively to you guys for the entire drive and loved every second. Thank you so much for having a podcast that is so relatable and easy to listen to. We both can't wait to catch up and listen to every episode. Wow. Wow. That's what a great review. Thank you so much for taking the time to leave this. And if you're not on Apple Podcasts, if you're on Spotify, still just following the podcast and leaving a star rating, yeah. it really, really helps. We would appreciate it so much. Smash that follow button. Smash those stars. Do it all. <laughs> all right. Well, that's it for today's episode of Pillow Talks. Thank you so much for listening. Join us again next week when we have another part two for you. Two part twos in a row. What do women really think about? Insert the blank.